The Arctic Winter Games warm-up show is brought to you by Yukon North of Ordinary Magazine. Hi, welcome to the Arctic Winter Games Warm Up, a show that we hope will get you bouncing with excitement for the 2012 Whitehorse Arctic Winter Games. So stick around, there's lots coming up on the program, and we're going to show you how you can, can play, play your, your part. part. In this episode of the show, we'll infiltrate the world of pin trading and get you ready with a few tips for that major pastime during Games Week. And we'll visit with the snowboarding teams from both the Yukon and the Northwest Territories to see how they are getting ready for the Games. And we visited with Borealis, the official mascot of the 2012 Games, to see if he can crack our list of the top five Arctic Winter Game mascots of all time. And finally, we got the lowdown on what to expect from the cultural side of things at the Games, what musicians and artists are going to be in town to celebrate this fabulous event. So stick around, there's lots coming your way on the Arctic Winter Games warm-up, brought to you by Yukon, North of Ordinary Magazine. Major games like the Arctic Winter Games involve the popular pastime of pin trading. People come from far and wide to get their hands on the little nuggets that come in all different shapes, sizes, and designs, and these Arctic Winter Games will be no different. We visited with pin trading guru and host society president George Arkan to learn more. So I'm here with the grand poobah of pins, Mr. George Arkan himself, who's also the host society president, and Rachel Clark, pin collecting aficionado, and you guys are going to teach me how to trade some pins so we're ready for the Arctic Winter Games. So how do I get pins? I'm, I'm, I'm excited. The Arctic Winter Games are coming. I want to trade some pins. Okay. Well, when the games start, you've got, a, you've got the opportunity to go to the Pin Trading Center and you can buy some or you can go to the people there that have <laughs> tables full of pins and try and, and get some. We have people that come to the territory expressly to trade pins. Wow. And I see you are, you are sporting uh, a collection there. These are, these are the kinds of pins that you can see more readily. One like this will be very hard to get because we don't have them. Obviously our sponsor has them and so you need to go and talk to them. Are you one of these people who is going to be at the at the pin trading center? I'm still I would say a novice at pin trading. It sort of just came naturally. I got given pins and all of a sudden someone was like, Hey I like your pin. Do you want to trade it? And I that's how I got started. See I, I have here my meager collection of pins. I got a Yukon College pin and an Arctic Winter Games 50 days out. So I go to the pin trading center or, or walk up to someone uh, downtown uh, that has pins in their coat and say, I really like that pin. Would you be interested in trading? If you're coming up to someone who has a pin and you like it, so I say, Chris, that's a really nice pin. I'd like to trade it. I have this one from Team Yukon from 96 that I'd like to trade you for. And if you like my pin, then you say, yeah, we'll trade. Okay. And, and it's important that you take the pin that you have showing, not your extra in the pocket or the one in your purse, and trade it directly. So, are you good to trade? Yes, that sounds yeah? wonderful. Like 1996 Team Yukon pin. This is a 50 days out 2012 pin. Perfect. Yeah, this is going to be a hot collector's item someday. What makes for that 
desirable or that hot pin of the games? Well, what you're going to find is that in our, our daily paper, you're going to see the hot pin of the day. You're going to see the top 10 pins listed. And so every unit out there that's buying pins is trying to come up with a unique design style, something that's going to steal the show. I think it was Nunavut. They created an Inukshuk out of all of their pins. And each piece, ha was you had to obtain it from a different group of the games. You couldn't just go up to any one person and get this pin. You actually had to go to so many different people to try and get a complete Inukshuk on you. The, the puzzle pin is huge, yeah. which is what she's referring to. And so I know the host society likely has a puzzle pin somewhere in its in its collection. So this is a sneak preview. We have here an Arctic Winter Games warm-up show ex sneak peek exclusive. I can't give you a peek, but I can give you some some uh, heads up that uh, there will be a puzzle pin within the host society's. In fact, there may be more than one. And right. Then, and then uh, there will be another one that's really unique, and it's the pin for the song relay. What? It has become sort of a trend is sponsor pins actually. So sponsors of the games will create their own pins and George has mentioned before these pins are rare because the sponsor creates them and there's very a limited number of them. So unless you actually come into contact with a sponsor who has that pin and is willing to trade it with you, then you may or may not even see it. Okay, so I'm getting ready for, for pin collecting. In summary, I have to get some pins. I have to wear them. You have to display. You have to interact. Yes. You have to try to meet as many different contingents and athletes and sponsors as, as possible to get some desirable pins. And it doesn't hurt to be a friend of this guy. <laughs> Look for this man when you come to Whitehorse oh, for the Arctic Winter Games. <laughs> He's got the hot pins. He'll hook you up. Maybe. <laughs> Did you know? An Arctic Winter Games tradition that goes back to the first games in 1970 is the publishing of the daily newspaper, The Ulu News, throughout the week of the games. The newspaper, which has been produced over the years through partnership with the game's host society and an independent newspaper publisher in the host community, has served to communicate schedules, results, information, along with photos and stories of the week's activities, and also serves today as a rich historical account of each individual games. The Ulu News has been published every year of the Arctic Winter Games except for the 1976 games which were held in the tiny remote community of Shefferville, Quebec, where facilities were not available. At recent games, daily information such as scheduling and results have been available instantly online, but the Ulu News remains a source of expanded stories that are still enjoyed daily by games participants, organizers, and audience alike. The 2012 Ulu News will be published daily in partnership with the Whitehorse Star newspaper, so watch for it around Whitehorse in the coming weeks. Snowboarding has been a sport in the Arctic Winter Games since the year 2000 and has grown to be one of the most popular spectator events featuring exciting disciplines such as the border cross and the half pipe. Well, snowboarding is a great way to get out and enjoy the winter and we've got lots of that up here so why not make it rad? So for the Arctic Winter Games, as far as you know, a northern venue, Mount Sema is pretty much top of the line, isn't it? Definitely. Out of the games I've been involved in, it's the biggest, most diverse place that we've had them for snowboarding. We've got a brand new half pipe. Um, we've had terrain work done in the slope style park, and there's a border cross course going in as well. Tell us, like, what do you recommend? What's what's good to see? I would recommend each and every event. <laughs> Um, it depends what you're looking for though. So for slope style, you'll see jumps and rails, uh, very much like the sort of thing you'll see in the X Games. Um, half pipe is just like what you saw in the Olympics, only on a bit smaller scale. And always exciting is the snowboard cross, which is for, um, for riders racing down the mountain, going over jumps, uh, doing bank turns, and uh, it's just fastest to the bottom wins. The Arctic Winter Games is a fantastic stepping stone to the next level of snowboard competition in Canada. It's higher level than our local events would be if you're just competing against your neighbour who you're snowboarding with all the time. We're not quite Whistler, so 
um, there's a bit of a, a gap there. So the Art of Quinter Games is a nice filler and a great stepping stone. Are there actual athletes that have used the Arctic Winter Games as a stepping stone to move on to greater competition out in the country? Most definitely. There's quite a few athletes that have done that. Um, we've seen riders like uh, Pierce and uh, Brooke from Alberta that have moved on to the national development team. We also have Yukon athletes who have moved on to do very well in provinces like BC, uh, working with the provincial team there. And uh, we also have athletes that are doing well in, in Alberta, having moved south for school. So it's great. It's really working as a stepping stone. I know the Northwest Territories program has developed quite a bit um, and that quite a few of their team members are actually training south this year. So we're going to see a, a really vast level of competition when the games comes around. Um, there's also the past coach of the NWT team is now working at Canada Snowboard, which is our national body. So um, the Arctic Games helps develop athletes and it also helps develop support um, structure and careers for people involved in sport that aren't necessarily on their way to the Olympics. I think there's going to be a very high level of competition, um, both from Yukon and NWT, and you cannot discount the Alberta riders, and you never know what's going to come over from Alaska. And we also have Greenland participating, so Greenland's definitely walked away with medals in the past. Borealis, the husky dog, is the official mascot of the 2012 Arctic Winter Games, and he's getting ready for a busy games week coming up soon. But who is Borealis? What makes him tick? And does he have what it takes to crack our top five list of the greatest Arctic Winter Games mascots of all time? So there must have been many applicants for the role of mascot of the 2012 Arctic Winter Games. What was it about Borealis that appealed to you in making the choice? Well, let's see. Uh, well, you know, Borealis was born in the Northern Lights, first of all, eh? when the uh, 2007 Canada Winter Games extinguished those cauldrons at the end of the games. The children of the North lit lanterns from those embers, sent them up into the northern sky, and that's when Borealis was born. But you're right, we chose Borealis because he's a playful pup, he's got endless energy, uh, loyalty to his pack, and he's just a fun-loving guy. He likes to have fun. So is, is he a hard-working mascot? Oh, definitely. Oh, you should see what he does to get ready. Ready for the games. He's, he's been at the groomers. He's, uh, he's been, you know, sprucing up his hockey uniform. He's got two different hats that he wears. He's got a balaclava with the ponytails and, and a hockey helmet, of course, when he's on the ice. Oh, yeah, he's been working on his hockey skills. What's a day like with, with, with Borealis? He's, he's a rascal, you know. There's times when you got to stay on top of him. First of all, he's a husky, so he will eat anything. His favorite foods, I would say, are salmon, mm, probably ice cream. So, you know, when we go buy a concession or we see a kid with a hot dog, we have to keep an eye on this guy. So he's, he's a regular husky, you know, with a, with a crazy appetite. What really moves Borealis himself to be a good mascot? Well, he's, uh, he loves meeting people from different places because he's a traveler too. I mean, he came from those northern lights. Um, he's excited to meet the athletes and see the cultural stuff. Uh, he loves those Arctic games. He's so excited to welcome people to Whitehorse. Do you think Borealis has what it takes to be one of the greatest Arctic Winter Games mascots of all time? I think so. I do. I, I think he's working on his moves. He's been practicing his dance routines and he, he is just so ready to go. So excited. Well, Borealis, you have some pretty stiff competition for not even Rascal the Raven and his cheeky name was able to make it on our list of the top five Arctic Winter Games mascots of all time. All time. Number five. Number four. The first games to actually have an official mascot even incorporated his image into the game's logo and the 1986 Ram from Whitehorse busted heads all week long. Number four. Number four. Look out, Apollo Creed. Slave Lake 1994 was represented by Rocky Bal Boulder, a rock-solid version of the Michelin Man who came to town taking on all customers in true Northern Alberta style. Number three. Number three. Not animal or mineral, Paddy the Paddle Wheeler was a mode of transportation who welcomed participants to the 1992 games in Whitehorse. Number two. Number Going way back to the late Jurassic period and the only reptile on our list, 
Oh look, the Pachyrhinosaurus dinosaur was a hit with the kids in Grand Prairie in 2010. The number one mascot of all time. Knifey, the yellow knife from Yellowknife, 1990. No other mascot can match Knifey's combination of razor sharp flair, utility, swashbuckling good looks, while also being a literal manifestation of the city name from which he hails. The 2012 Arctic Winter Games will feature an incredible array of cultural activities. So here's a preview. So the Arctic Winter Games are happening 40 days from today. If everybody could just get some sleep and eat really healthy food because it's going to be wild. Well, it's called Cold Spell, How We Winter. So it's about getting through the winter. We're calling it a warm cabaret. It's a variety show, but it's also very musically driven. But I think we're trying to shed light on the more positive sides for the most yeah, part. Yeah, what we do in the winter, everything uh, exciting about it. Um, our local band includes Mr. Ryan McNally. We also have local favorites Rob Bergman, Andrew McCollman, Lauren Powell, and Dave Haddock will be our band leader. I'm really excited to see them kind of take our idea and run with it. Who's exciting you? Uh, Catherine Calder, because she is amazing. She's a very successful Canadian independent musician and very good songwriter. She also plays with the new pornographers, which is a fairly big deal. Plus we've got Chris Dirksen coming from uh, Vancouver, and she's a cellist. Like She's a, a classical cellist, but she uses a loop pedal and she creates like a, a whole composition with just her and the loop pedal. We'll also have um, bits and pieces that aren't music, so Brian Fiddler's going to come up with some puppetry, I'm sure, which will be hilarious about getting through the winter. And we're screening a Moira Sauer film, which is a very bizarre look at getting through the winter, I would say, and it'll be a treat for the Yukon audiences because not a lot of people have seen it here yet. And my friend Jen, she's from Toronto, she's a circus artist, she's uh, silks, aerial silks. So that'll be a pretty big, uh, woo, different part of our show. I'm very excited. This is uh, some of the most wonderful musicians that I've had a privilege of working with over the years. So we have these four wonderful Aboriginal women who are going to collaborate over the course of a few days. Four Aboriginal women who strong, strong performers. Uh, Juno Award winning artist Leela Gilday from Yellowknife. She's the co-artistic producer with me on this show, Diet from Burwash Landing. Sylvia Cloutier from Nunavut is coming in. She's a throat singer and a drum dancer and she's bringing that into the mix and the collaboration. And then a wonderful artist out of Greenland by the name of Nevi Nielsen. So we have these this sort of Northern European and Northern Canadian mix of artists that are going to work together. They're writing some new material. It's going to be at the Yukon Art Centre on March the 5th. It sort of kicks off the galas that they're having that week. It's the first one that's going in and uh, putting together a really amazing show. One last thing, um, I just wanted to also announce today this big announcement that the Northern Lights School of Dance um, won the opportunity to be Team Yukon for the cultural contingent and I'd like to introduce their leader Brianne Lachard and she'll introduce the team. You guys must be so excited about the upcoming Winter Games. Um, so, do you remember like how you were told that you guys were chosen to represent the Yukon in the cultural area? Like our dance team. Our dance. Dance. <laughs> so you guys. What happened is we got a letter, and um, yeah. when we we it's actually posted on the wall so everybody can see it. And I think it just kind of trickled out that way, like oh yes, you guys are going to Arctic Winter Games. <laughs> it got really exciting that way. Yeah. So have the practice hours augmented since yeah. then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, they just started, yeah. They're yeah. like just started this week. Couple yeah. hours We've a week. We've added about two, three hours, three hours at least yeah. in wow, choreography. Awesome. And How many songs are you guys going to do? Four. 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 Five. Four. Five. Four. Five. Four. Five. Yeah. Five. We're not sure yet. <laughs> That's awesome. Did you know? The first Russian participation in the Arctic Winter Games involved a small cultural delegation from the Siberian province of Magadan at the 1990 Games in Yellowknife, when Russia was still known as the Soviet Union. At Whitehorse in 1992, the first small group of athletes participated in the Games under the contingent name of Russia. 
From 1994 to 1998, two separate teams from the Russian provinces of Magadan and Tiumen participated each year. In 2000 and 2002, the province of Chukotka replaced Tiumen and participated along with Magadan. In 2004, the province of Yamal replaced Chukotka. Due to the struggling post-communist economic times, the early years of Russian participation involved underfunded teams who often relied on the generosity of the host community to supply much-needed equipment and supplies for the visiting Russian teams. The teams even went to such lengths at the games as attempting to sell Russian souvenirs, including vodka, in order to raise funds for the trip. Since 1996, the only Russian contingent at the Games has come from the autonomous region of Yamal Nenets, a prosperous gas-producing Arctic region in central Russia, home to the Nenets, Kanti, and Selkup indigenous peoples. In 2012, Team Yamal is sending a contingent of 93 people who will be participating in seven sports and cultural activities. Thanks for joining us on the show. There's only a few more days left until the games begin. Be sure to visit www.awg2012.org for everything you need to know about how you can be involved with the games. There's information on where to get your tickets to the events and how you can get in the spirit with your own official games wear. Thanks for joining us on the show on Northwest Dell Community TV and be sure to check out our daily coverage of the Arctic Winter Games on White Horse Cable 9 and Yellowknife Cable 20 starting March the 5th and running throughout the entire week. I'm Chris McNutt. And I'm Tracy Shire. Thanks again for joining us for the Arctic Winter Games warm-up show. We hope you're ready. And remember to play, play your part. Oh, nice. The Arctic Winter Games warm-up show is brought to you by Yukon North of Ordinary Magazine.